Dzień dobry Państwu. Good afternoon. A warm welcome to our debate. My name is Łukasz Adamski. I'm the deputy director of the Center for Polish-Russian Dialogue and Understanding. I'm very happy to see so many of you coming to a debate, which is pretty much of a new thing in political discussions. We will be talking about trolling, disinformation activities conducted in information space on the Internet. We will be talking about methods <coughs> which uh, the Russian state uh, uses to affect uh, the situation in Poland and in other countries in the region. I do not want to take too much of your time because I believe that uh, what our panelists have to say will be much more interesting and worthy of attention than what I have to say. I, just, I would just like to say that our institution has also fallen victim to trolling, and we will talk about this later, I believe. But before we proceed to that, I would like to introduce the participants of the debate. Um, I will begin with our Slovak and the panelist, Ivana Smolenova, who works in the Prague Institute on Security Studies. Then we have Olga Irisova, who comes from Russia, but works as an editor in a project uh, conducted and financed by the Polish uh, Russian Understanding uh, Committee in the intersection project, uh, and she deals with uh, disinformation campaigns. Justyna Wojciechowska from Poland, although presently also partly from Belarus, uh, analytic from the Polish Institute of International Affairs. So we have um, representatives of Russia, Slovakia, Poland, and Ukraine as uh, the debate uh, will be moderated by um, the Yevgeny uh, Klimaki, a Ukrainian um, journalist working in Poland. So I hope you will like the discussion, and I'm passing the floor to the moderator. So maybe Justin, I will um, talk to us about Belarusian uh, trolling uh, while we're at it. So I will begin remotely. I'm a journalist. Uh, I was lucky yesterday to be recording an interview uh, with an outstanding uh, uh, Russian uh, writer uh, and great uh, man, Boris Akunin. As we talked, uh, I mentioned uh, the subject of trolling. As on his uh, Facebook account, he has more than 100,000 followers. And I asked if there are trolls among them. But, and he said that there are very many, but he is understanding and he realizes that they have to make money somehow, so uh, he just lets it go. And if someone is excessive in their behavior, then he deletes them. One day a troll wrote to him. It was a troll who became converted. He decided that it is not a good thing to do in his life. Maybe he found a different job, but he admitted that he had been working in a troll factory. He came to work every day, wrote 120 comments every day. He had 20. In profiles, and uh, he came to the understanding that this is a wrong thing to do, and he apologized to Akunin, and, and he was writing on his uh, website. Uh, uh, Akunin said I ha that he hoped that uh, that guy wouldn't do that anymore. Uh, unfortunately, there are not too many converts like that, and hence this debate. Mm, the trolls. Well, trolling is a part of an immense propaganda machine. Uh, so why don't we begin um, from the technicalities, from the back office? How does it work, those troll factories and the propaganda mm, uh, workshops? To me here, uh, I'd like to start with describing the profile of average Kremlin troll, uh, thousands of whom uh, have flooded the internet to cause confusion both in Western and Russian websites. Who are them, uh, what methods they use, and maybe the most important question, who pay them for loving Putin for 12 hours a day? 
Uh, for the first time, we received reliable information about the work of so-called Kremlin trolls in September 2013, uh, thanks to the publication in uh, Nizavisima Gazeta. That time, the exposed office was located in uh, Petersburg district of Olgina. Later, it was relocated to the city itself. Unfortunately, we don't know the exact number of uh, similar operations, but at least we can talk about four uh, same troll factories, two in Republic of Adyghe, one in Moscow, and also one in uh, Nizhny Novgorod uh, region. Uh, Organa office alone employed 400 people when it was located in Olgina. When it was relocated to uh, the Savushkina Street in St. Petersburg, this number was reduced to 250 people. Organ office received uh, for its operation 20 million rubles monthly, which is roughly equivalent of 273,000 euro. Uh, this St. Petersburg uh, operation was financed through the Concord uh, Holding that is headed by Evgeny Prigozhin, Putin's personal friend. Uh, since 2000, uh, this holding is catering bankers in Kremlin and also it is associated and affiliated with the Russian Ministry of Defense. Uh, hence, the link between Olgina Troll Factory and the Kremlin seems quite obvious. Moreover, Evgeny Prigozhin himself now is trying to use recently passed law uh, on the right for to be forgotten. Uh, via court, he is trying to force uh, internet search engines to remove links on certain online content, including materials that have uh, him personally linked to this Kremlin uh, troll factory in Olgina. Most of the time when we speak about trolls, we speak about those who are paid and ordered by the Kremlin to comment on their internet. Uh, on social media posts or on the articles online. But the work of Kremlin trolls is far more diverse. And we can distinguish at least seven categories of uh, trolls working in these uh, troll factories. First category uh, is the authors of patriotic articles written uh, for specially created uh, so-called right proper patriotic uh, media outlets. Uh, they are required to write on average one, two articles a day on predetermined topics with a technical task uh, that dictates uh, what conclusion the author must um, make and what narratives to promote. Uh, second category employing the same uh, pattern are the bloggers. And there are two types of uh, troll bloggers. First type is the professional bloggers uh, that are usually about one accounts that used to be among uh, top reads in life uh, journal that are now updated by several people at the same time and mostly devoted to political commenting. But larger portion of trolls are working with uh, niche blogs uh, with narrow specialization. For instance, you could have a diet or healthy eating blog that from time to time would post about the current situation in the world. Picturing <coughs> Sorry, picturing a world, <clears throat> a world where the U.S. is producing chaos and is trying. <clears throat> Sorry. So these bloggers picturing the world uh, where the U.S. is trying to destroy Russia, and uh, of course, uh, Ukrainian fascists uh, helping them in that. Such a, <coughs> I'm sorry. Such a niche bloggers must have 10 posts a day on the average, and these blogger trolls usually receive greater salaries than simple commentators. For Moscow, the norm for professional bloggers is about 1,000 euro. For St. Petersburg, it is about 620 euro. Uh, the third category of troll factory is the commentators in social media, fourth commentators of news and articles on the web. And these two categories on average must produce at least 135 uh, commentaries a day. Um, 
Fifth category is the creative types, people who produce memes, pictures, and infographics. <coughs> and sixth category is the video bloggers. Uh, seventh category, people that work directly with our Western audience. And these are the people that primarily monitor publications on Russia and Ukraine in Western media and attack those journals with uh, anti-Western, pro-Kremlin, and anti-Ukrainian attacks. Uh, this department of larger troll factory works with Western so-called experts that using their own credentials and own name uh, publish pro-Kremlin pieces in the countries of their origin. And now I would like to highlight the work and new methods of most numerous division of Troll Factory. I mean uh, paid for commentators. Uh, the main purpose of their efforts is evident. To create the illusion of overall support for Putin's policy, to stifle alternative views, <coughs> and force them to retreat to internal immigration. Uh, so their direct activity is aimed at misinformation, but more generally, it negatively impacts on the psychology of those who are used to getting their information from the net. Uh, firstly, the language they use is far more aggressive than the language of the general user. Secondly, attacks by trolls result in the fact that the majority of liberal or simply uh, moderate uh, editions had to enable their uh, comment sections altogether, <coughs> depriving the online community of uh, the opportunity to exchange their real views. And on those websites where comments are st still remain open, one anti-Putin statement is counteracted with their uh, thousands of uh, pro-Kremlin statements uh, made by uh, paid-for commentators. Uh, this results in the fact that those who fully or partially disagree with policies pursued by Putin start to experience the feeling of uh, isolation. Uh, which in turn prompts them to embrace the practice of uh, self-censorship in order to stay away from their aggressive majority. Uh, it is obvious that trolls have been created not in order to really prove something to somebody in the internet, but in order to create the illusion of overall uh, support of an active uh, majority which supports anything that the regime does. Uh, besides distribution of disinformation and creating the informational noise, uh, these trolls have recently been used more and more to block undesired social media users. Trolls would send thousands of uh, fake complaints on uh, Russian and Ukrainian uh, Facebook and t Twitter users uh, that write about politics, demanding those accounts to be blocked. Unfortunately, as we can see now, uh, both Twitter and Facebook uh, in this game play right into their uh, troll hands. They just simply temporarily block anti-Putin accounts. A uh, relatively new approach uh, in the Russian segment of internet is direct provocation <coughs> of users that express anti-Putinist views. Uh, in, in order to for to force them to formulate their response uh, in the way that could be used for prosecution in accordance with so-called anti-extremist laws. This could truly be a very dangerous practice that gains tremendous momentum right now. It seems that in today's Russia, articles calling for extremism and separatism uh, in the panel code are uh, the most popular targets when it comes to the persecution of civic activists uh, for their activity in their internet. It's worth noting that the number of those uh, convicted having been found guilty under the article uh, 100, uh, 282 of the Penal Code increased threefold in Russia in 2015 in comparison with, with the level of uh, 2011. In fact, the overall number of conviction for the use of the internet for extremist purposes has risen dramatically. 
According to the Agora International Human Rights uh, Center, since the beginning of this year, already four people have been sentenced for sharing their opinion in the internet. 23 users uh, were deprived of their liberty uh, for the internet activity in 2015. 21 of them have been uh, have received real jail sentences, while two of them were sent to the mental hospital, which is de facto also the, de the deprivation of liberty. So in Russia, within the last one and a half years, nine out of 25 sentences for internet activity, or 36%, were for addressing the war of, uh, in Ukraine or annexation of Crimea, in text, images, uh, reports, or simply likes. The Russian authorities are sending a tangible message to the society. There are topics that should not be touched on the internet. And if the trolls are effective in provoking the users, uh, the number of uh, ordinary citizens jailed just to scare the others could rise drastically. Uh, now a few words about uh, Kremlin propaganda Im implementation uh, in Western countries. Besides already mentioned trolls that work with uh, non-Russian language segments of the internet and paid by the Kremlin's so-called experts, propaganda is delivered to the West uh, via three main channels. First of all, it is Russian media, uh, broadcasting and published in English and other European languages. Uh, now we are talking about uh, Russia Direct, Russia Beyond the Headlines, uh, Sputnik, um, and some others. Uh, these media are not hiding where their money comes from, and they're trying to interest their potential users or viewers with their uh, alternative views. Uh, and unfortunately, in many cases, we see that Western institution, institutions help to legitimize this media. For example, uh, Foreign Policy and The Guardian, the New East Network, have Kremlin's Russia Direct as a partner. This partnership doesn't, however, directly affect their uh, text published in Foreign Policy or in Guardian, but it legitimizes a Russia Direct in the eyes of, uh, as a reputable and trustful source in the eyes of the readers of Foreign Policy and Guardian. Uh, second channel spreading the Kremlin agenda uh, is the citizens of the Western nations that have credibility in their communities and have been seduced by Kremlin's fees. We are talking about former politicians that get positions in Russian state companies or fees for participating in particular projects uh, in these companies for transmitting Kremlin's messages and narrative. Same works for journalists, political scientists, uh, economists. A separate case here would be the European populist that Kremlin supports financially. And finally, the third channel is creation of new local European media with the help of the Kremlin. Uh, this media can be uh, either in English or local languages, or sometimes in Russian, either focusing on Russian-speaking minorities. I think my colleagues uh, here will give you a more direct uh, and detailed vision of how it works and is perceived uh, by the European audience, but I would like to stress out uh, uh, another important moment. Uh, Kremlin propaganda targeting foreign countries has a crucial importance for forming anti-Western views uh, inside of Russia. Uh, because Putin-sponsored forces obediently broadcast all the Russian propaganda myths to Russians, but they are the perspective of Europeans in this instance. And within Russia, their views are presented as uh, the views of the majority of Europeans. So the message which is delivered to the Russian is, it's everything is bad here, and since everything is so bad here, it's better not to follow their lead. In the foreseeable future, uh, we cannot expect nothing but extension of ongoing anti-Western campaign in Russia. If one looks at the graph of Putin's popularity, uh, we can see that four peaks of his uh, public support uh, was achieved against the backdrop of ongoing anti-Western campaigns 
and uh, the creation of the image of um, external threat. The first peak was achieved in late 1999. Uh, the image of the West, the enemy, formed against the backdrop of uh, NATO bombing of Yugoslavia. Uh, the second peak was in late 2003, a uh, fomenting of anti-American sentiment triggered by the uh, campaign, American campaign in Iraq. Uh, the third peak was in 2008, when uh, Russia-Georgian war was portrayed in Russian media as uh, the confrontation of uh, Russia and the US. And the fourth peak of Putin's popularity has continued uh, from 2014 until now. It's not worthy that the current state of uh, social consolidation uh, around Putin was achieved by, um, was preceded by the era of uh, mass protest of 2011 and 12. And as few as 29% of Russians were willing to vote for Putin by uh, January 2014. His credibility rate in that time dropped to uh, 61%. Given such a situation, only a time-honored uh, method could help raise this rating. Forced consolidation uh, around the leader, thanks to a manufactured threat, namely U Ukrainian so-called fascist, and more, in more general terms, uh, the West and the US that wants to destroy Russia. Negative mobilization has worked once again. Uh, thus, we can see that Putin's popularity recipe lies in the skillful play on the mistru mistrust of Russians for the West dating back to the Soviet days. And the uh, fomenting of anti-Western hysteria is nothing more than uh, a means of maintaining Putin's power. Thank you. Thank you so much, Olga. Any discussion about Russia just doesn't work without the words Vladimir Putin. So we had to refer to him. But to go back to propaganda and the trolling and the content that's being written by the trolls. I once met a uh, British journalist who wrote about trolling and he had met many trolls in real life. And he talked about this interesting method that apparently the trolls come to the troll factory in the morning and they split into groups of three. For example, Justina, Ivana and myself, we are a three, a team of three, and we divide the roles. For example, Justina and Ivana will be the good troll and I'll be the bad troll. So, when, for example, the Radio Free Europe or any other free Russian media, like uh, television or um, others, show content which is not to the liking of the Kremlin, then the girls would start praising, then I would start criticizing, and then the discussion starts and I convince them, I convert them. So somebody who is not a troll can see that, wow, there's a discussion there. And uh, they have been uh, convinced that uh, the Kremlin is right. And the ordinary man does not uh, su suspect that this is the work of trolls. Now, what does recruitment look like? I entered uh, in Google and I just got one link. So is it easy to find work there? How does the recruitment look like? Uh, as far as we know, uh, there are thousands of uh, job offers of this kind now in the internet, and they're quite open on what their job requirements are. And you can find these uh, job offers in the websites like Headhunter, Job Offers, and others. And they literally say that you will have to write uh, comments on political situations, or you will have to lead the blog. And the salaries there are pretty much higher than uh, on the average in the market. So that's why people tend to go and tend to agree to work there. For them, it's just the work. They don't understand that they are doing some propaganda thing. They just do their work. Well, I think they, they would understand what they are doing. They are not stupid. They know what they're doing. Now, to, a question to Ivana. And what does this machine of propaganda, Russian propaganda, how does it work in your country? 
And also, can you tell us about uh, the Czech Republic that the director mentioned at the beginning? So first of all, thank you for the invitation uh, to the Center for Polish Russian Dialogue and Understanding, and you for coming here, for finding the time uh, to be here uh, with us today. And um, what I would like to stress first, uh, propaganda is very, uh, it's kind of a case by case approach. There is no one propaganda on one disinformation campaign, in, the same in Russia, the same in Europe, the West, you know. There are different methods and strategies used, for example, in Balkans, in Czech Republic, Slovakia, in Poland, uh, and uh, it's different in the UK. So uh, I'll just l describe how the propaganda works in the Czech Republic and Slovakia, because I'm actually Slovak, but I live uh, in Czech Republic. I've been there for nine years, so I'm kind of like somewhere in between all the time. Uh, Two weeks ago, we had a we had a roundtable discussion in Prague. Uh, it's a, it was a closed door expert roundtable with people from all the Visegrad four countries: so Czech Republic, Slovakia, uh, Hungary, and Poland. And we discussed Russian disinformation and uh, how it works and um, differences between various countries. And uh, interestingly, uh, we concluded in the end that Czech Republic and Slovakia is the new battleground for Russian propaganda. It's stronger than in Poland and then in Hungary. And uh, there are various reasons for this. Uh, in Hungary, you actually don't need to use propaganda. They already have a very good ally sitting in the uh, uh, presidential palace and uh, in the whole political uh, elite. Then also in Poland, it's considered to be too, too, how to put it, hawkish uh, or not very uh, friendly towards Russia. So there's no point of like uh, to be too active. But like Czech Republic and Slovakia is somewhere in the middle, and they're still worth uh, 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 fighting for this place. At least that's what we concluded in the end. And I also like to put Czech Republic and Slovakia into one media or information space. Uh, because of the language proximity, because uh, uh, we understand each other, uh, Czech me uh, I Slovak uh, uh, people in Slovakia, they read Czech uh, Czech uh, media. It's kind of one information space, but there are two different audiences, and I'll, I'll demonstrate it on the on the numbers. Uh, there was a poll last year, uh, 2015, that uh, compared the trust towards Russia and trust trust towards. Uh, uh, United States and 31% uh, of Slovaks trust Russia as a country, so every third Slovak, uh, while in Czech Republic it's only 16%. And uh, as for the trust towards United States, it's 27% of Slovaks trust United States, so it's less than Russia. And in Czech Republic it's 41, so it's again a big difference. So there are two different audiences, Czech Republic and Slovakia. But the methods and, and how it works, it's very similar in both countries. Uh, in Czech Republic and Slovakia we have huge numbers of, a huge number of websites, of alternative media websites that has been created in the last three, four years. Uh, the, the, this phenomenon gained more attention in media and among experts uh, over a year ago. It was February 2015 when one Slovak activist, Juraj Smatana, he published a list of 42 websites, 42 uh, websites that spread Russian propaganda in Czech Republic and Slovakia. Uh, today the number is somewhere around 100. It's over 100 in both countries. So this is a big number of all kinds of like dubious websites, blog, uh, blog, and all kinds of like uh, platforms. Uh, there's nothing like a typical Russian website. They're all different. Some are more aggressive. Some are more professional. Some are poorly pro-Russians. Others are just like anti-establishment, so it really differs. But however, there are a number of common characteristics or a number of common features they have in, they have in common. Uh, first, they are very strongly anti-Western, anti-United States, anti-NATO, anti-EU. To lesser extent, they are, uh, they are pro-Putin and pro-Russia. Pro um, they're usually something along the lines um, 
you know, Russia is not perfect, but it's less aggressive, less, less aggressive than the United States. So it's not perfect, but it's still better than what we have. Uh, and this, like, you, imp you kind of, like, imply or uh, that the Russia is the savior and uh, it's better than the United States or EU or your own government. Uh, they use conspiracy theories, they use lies, uh, half-truths. Uh, they use very emotionally charged words and pictures, you know, uh, pictures of children being, you know, abused in Ukraine, for example, or things that, that are supposed to uh, play on your emotions or use your emotions to get your attention or to convince you of something. Then uh, all of them claim no allegiance to Kremlin. They are all independent. They, they have nothing to do. They, they, they even strongly like oppose any connection with Kremlin, with Russia. Uh, but interestingly, uh, what they say and what arguments they use, it's basically the same. They copy each other. Uh, I did a, a publication or, or study a year ago, over a year ago, and I was analyzing the arguments and the narratives they use. Uh, I picked a few of the platforms, the most, uh, the most aggressive and the most uh, popular. And I was, uh, I was analyzing articles for within one month of their, of their writing. And basically, I put them in the table, you know, the, all together according to topics, United States, NATO, uh, politicians, media. And basically, uh, when I compared what they say, they copy each other. It's like, it's almost like, it's almost like somebody is like telling them what to say. But anyway, they, they all claim like very, uh, independence or like um, they are alternative and I actually believe some of them uh, majority of them have nothing to do with Russia but we can discuss this uh, later uh, as for when they were funded founded it's usually last four or five years some were created 2013 2012 few of them 2011 but with the crisis in ukraine or with the war in uh, ukraine uh, and annexation of crimea they became very active like suddenly uh, uh starting like right very uh, like aggressively against west uh against the government in ukraine so this this is another interesting thing so they were kind of like some i used to call them sleeping cells you know they they were created and suddenly started uh, out of nothing, being very active. But many of them were uh, active before, but it's less common. And uh, besides those websites, this big number of websites, I think it's somewhere between 100, maybe 120 in Czech Republic and Slovakia. There are uh, all kinds of uh, NGOs and, and uh, non-governmental organizations. Uh, there are uh, groups, there, are, uh, there is increasing number of uh, paramilitary groups, um, so young men that, you know, have uniforms and try to, paramilitary groups, uh, you know, like aggressively fighting um, somewhere in forests in Slovakia. And then, uh, then there are, of course, politicians, uh, and this is one of the biggest problems, uh, either former politicians, uh, as, as Olga discussed, but also people that are sitting in the government. Czech Republic, I don't know if you know the, the, the president, Zeman, he, his campaign was basically funded by, uh, by Russian companies. Uh, so he's a big advocate of, 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 and big supporter of, the, of, of this narratives. Uh, then there are also in Slovakia, there are some former politicians that are strongly advocating for this. So this is basically the techniques they, they're using um, in Czech Republic and Slovakia. And also, uh, I've been watching it for some time, and it is also changing. It, it's getting more sophisticated. Like uh, two years ago, it was more about conspiracy theories of, or like using fakes, uh, uh, fake information, fake pictures. Uh, this is changing. This is less present in the campaign, in this disinformation campaigns. It's becoming more about like, Mm, relativization of everything, of truth. You cannot trust anybody, uh, or uh, blaming West, blaming, uh, for example, United States is responsible for the immigration crisis, or uh, using uh, blaming 
or using fear against immigrants. And these are things, well, you can, you can uh, debunk conspiracy theory or you can debunk fake information by proving this is not truth. But it's, if, you, if you relativize, if, you, if you're saying that uh, Europe is be, before crisis and or immigrants are gonna rape your children, this is very hard to disprove. This is like playing on, on basic feelings or like fear of, of fear of, of emotions, that's very hard to debunk. So it's getting more sophisticated. Ivana, Ivana, thank you so much. Now I'm going to give the floor to Justyna. Now, Ivana told us that in Slovakia and Czech Republic, there are over 100 websites that uh, carry out Russian propaganda. Is it a similar scale here in Poland, do you think? Right, can you hear me? Well, I, I can't tell you the exact number. And I suppose that the reason why I cannot give you the number is that nobody is doing the maths, nobody is counting. And the problem here in Poland is that we started off with a very optimistic uh, assumption, something that Ivana referred to that Poland is kind of safe uh, from the Russian propaganda because we tend to be very skeptical towards Russia. So uh, there is hardly any chance for, a, for an openly pro-Kremlin organization or NGO to appear um, here. And, uh, you know, that would uh, propagate these, uh, this propaganda from the Kremlin. So I think that was one of the reasons why we were kind of reassured, well, maybe not us, but the politicians in Poland were kind of reassured and they decided, you know, we don't have that problem really. But we do, we do have that problem. And again, to pick up on what Ivana said, now, if you speak as the third person, you always relate to what the previous speakers said. And I, I'm afraid that most important things have already been said by the two ladies. Now the methods and tools of the propaganda carried out by Kremlin, they always adapt to the local conditions. So they are different in every country and in different group of people or community. And that information space or the internet, you know, the, the approach has nationality, so to say. So every country is different and the methods are adapted. In Poland, the most vulnerable point, I believe, is the Ukrainian issue. So, to put it in a nutshell, there is this rule that uh, when we have some message that, it, you know, if you want to be effective, it's not good if you shout out, I love Putin, but rather if you copy what the Kremlin is doing because then that's something that links us, you know, we have common goals. In this particular case, I think the Ukrainian topic is uh, a very good field for the Russian operation. As I look at the Polish uh, media space, I can see that Poles do not like Ukrainians because in Ukraine there are revolutions quite regularly and uh, the Ukrainian society is, we believe, kind of persecuted by their own government. So every now and then we have this uh, outburst of feelings of uh, sympathy or empathy for the Ukrainians, or at least this is something that we are talking about in the media, that we have to help Ukrainians, they want to fight corruption, uh, you have to take down a bad government and so on. And that's one picture, but if you look at opinion polls, the picture is completely different and it is clear that Ukrainians are one of the least liked nationalities by polls. 
and uh, uh, the antipathy towards Ukrainians has been growing over the last years. After 2014, we have witnessed uh, a detrimental change. That would not in itself be a terrible problem because there are different nations with which we have similar situations. But the problem is that uh, the entire geostrategic strategic conflict uh, that we have uh, witnessed over the last years has concentrated around Ukraine. I'm not saying that I agree with uh, that view, but in practice what comes out is that either you are uh, in pro-Ukraine or pro-Russia. And when you look at the situation in the media, it is difficult to uh, remain uh, factual. It's a uh, black and white, zero, one situation. And, uh, so simply speaking, our relation, the better our relationships are with Ukraine, the more difficult it is for Ukraine, for, for the Kremlin to be active in this part of Europe. The conclusion being that it is in the best interest of Kremlin that our relationships with Ukraine should be worse rather than better. The Volin uh, subject, the, the Volin massacre uh, of the Second World War uh, is subject number one. That is something that the expert world, uh, myself included, and the political world and the world of experts has neglected, has been neglecting, and only started noticing over the last year or so, not even immediately after uh, anti-Maidan, after Kremlin, uh, after Crimea. And so we had to see all that we saw on the internet, that is the eruption of uh, of texts such as the Ukrainian is not my brother. Very many likes uh, on on the f uh, web profile, and Ukraine is not helping because I d and I don't want to go into the complex historical issues. But there have been several moves uh, on the Ukrainian side, which made it very difficult for the Polish. Uh, politicians to explain to the public why just after uh, the annexion of Crimea it is not a good time to talk about uh, clearing the Volin massacre. <coughs> and so when things like that happen it is it makes it very difficult to explain things to the public and those moods are on the rise we see that the need is growing in Poland to make the, the historical settlements. Why that is, that's a separate subject, but it may become very difficult. And boiling it down to uh, what, uh, what we just heard, that talking about uh, the Volin massacre is only in favor of the Russian massacre. That's also wrong. Uh, and it will uh, only make the subject grow internally with the potential to erupt. Let me just go back for a moment. <clears throat> Towards a more um, high-level view of uh, how Russian propaganda works. There is the so-called European Stratcon, uh, a, a unit uh, in the European Commission which deals with uh, uh, strategic communication, that is debunking the myths uh, popularized by the Russian media uh, via their own cells in the West and other and via other units which do not uh, admit the connections with the Kremlin. And that institution says in that one of the worst things is that you shouldn't really talk about Russian propaganda. It is Kremlin propaganda. And calling it Russian propaganda mm, takes us into another myth uh, which uh, 
which we would then have to debunk again. It is, after all, propaganda that is created and promoted and distributed by the Kremlin media. Therefore, I believe that we should stick to the exact uh, terminology and talk about Kremlin propaganda. Of course, it has a million faces, and as Ivana said, it will look differently in different places, but there is a certain set of rules which govern it. The most accurate description of how it works would be the so-called the 4D tactics, which uh, has been formulated last year by Ben Neiman, the analyst. The first one, the first D is dismiss. So uh, deny and uh, oppose the fact. Uh, what we have uh, in the Russian media on a day to day basis, and uh, that message is followed by um, the whole uh, social media. And the denial of the media, uh, we say that Western media, NATO, intelligence, they say that Russian army is in Ukraine and uh, Russia says there are, there, is no, there are no Russian military in Ukraine. And this happens all the time that there are millions of those trolls, the thousands and hundreds of thousands of those people in their comments. And this dilutes the fact which is uh, a fact of reality nonetheless. The next one is distort. That is to form information, introduce untrue elements into the factual information. The next D is distract. If someone accuses uh, you of something, you counter accuse that other person claim that they do what uh, what you are accused of doing. That also um, has been a, a key uh, characteristic of Russian diplomacy over the last year, as we see uh, in the military exercises of Russia over the last years. Uh, and uh, next, uh, uh, threatening. It uh, adopts different forms, starting from internet threats or trolling all the way to physical threats or real-life threats rather than just virtual. Two short examples here to end with, as I think that this indeed has to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis, but these are things that do have many things in common. A few months ago, New York Times uh, described a story in Ireland, which took part a year ago, uh, took place a, a year ago. Uh, the story of a journalist uh, Jessica Arrow, if I pronounce the name correctly. But let's just assume that was her name actually. She's a woman uh, who is a journalist uh, in dealing with Russian uh, trolling in Finland. We know that uh, it's a frontier state, very interested in what happens in Russia, um, highly involved economically and uh, feeling uh, um, embarrassed or insecure because of Russia's military operations in its vicinity. That journalist uh, started investigating the subject of trolls. She started with the internet, Twitter, she asked a question. And the first thing that happened after she asked it was uh, that she was overwhelmed with threats and insults. Even at that level, at that initial level of initial stage of her actions, you could clearly see how these very four um, rules operated. So she was accused of lying, 
she was made into an uh, American agent, an agent of the Baltz. Uh, she is a well-known American agent, and we know about her past. And of course, she deals uh, with narcotics. Uh, apart from being an American agent, she's also a drug dealer. Uh, so uh, Russia's defendants and her opponents uh, said that it is quite the opposite of what she said. Quite the opposite is true. It is Russia that has become the victim of information war, and it doesn't know how to defend itself uh, from all these attacks. So, so the truth is actually the opposite of what Jessica uh, wrote about. And that girl, that lady, she's a young woman, uh, received threats not only in the internet but also in real life. And she said something that was very important, that is that the troll went into her head after what happened every next publication, every work is preceded by thinking, what will they do if I do this? What else will they think of? And there was a story that she was once convicted uh, for uh, having, uh, for, for possessing, for possession of drugs. Uh, so, uh, so that thing was blown out to making her a drug dealer. The next thing is um, a story from our own experience. It is a story of Marcin Ludwig Rey, a person who most of you in this room probably know. He is a sort of a Don Quixote of uh, the Polish uh, fight against trolling, a man who on his own will and without being paid by anyone. He investigates those pro-Kremlin influences in Poland. I don't want to go into his views and uh, his motives, but the tools that, with the tools that he, he has available, he tries to analyze the influence that pro-Kremlin propaganda uh, has in Poland using publicly available information without access to any intelligence uh, data or institutional secrets. And he publishes it all on Facebook because he hasn't yet uh, um, established a, a website. So what ha happened to him? To begin with, as soon as he even began dealing with that, uh, he was accused of being a pedophile. In a small town near Krakow, and there were leaflets distributed with information that he's a pedophile who raped two little girls in France. The man actually had lived in France. He was uh, in uh, on emigration, then he came back to Poland. Interestingly, as you may or may not have heard, if not, then it's up. Uh, well, uh, the two girls he, that he, who uh, he was supposed to have uh, raped in France were called Yura and Asia, and the town was Givi, and it, and it also said that the man uh, uses a, a Motorola telephone device. So th this there's. Encoded information that it was involved with his uh, 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 pro-Ukrainian activities. So uh, I think you should explain that Givi and Motorola things. Uh, Euro and Asia. Uh, th these are a reference uh, to uh, this uh, notion or this entity which is uh, coming to receive a new political meaning uh, in the Russian policy and Givi and Aurora to, to uh, people from the Donbas area who became famous uh, of very various uh, violent acts, torturing people and uh, breaking all sorts of uh, international conventions. So it's a direct 
assault on a man who did something we don't like, threats and attempts at discrediting the man in his own environment where he lives. And so for someone who doesn't know what Givi and Motorola are, that may not mean anything. People uh, dubbed him as pedophile, and those things tend to stick to you, and they, they you may never uh, shake them off. Uh, so, uh, as Olga, Olga said uh, n about what the things that are done, uh, his accounts were blocked, uh, and he has some spare accounts for for when those accounts are blocked, but. Blocking of accounts is a very popular practice. Mm, reporting uh, in cases of violations uh, of uh, social um, uh, media sites. And a few days ago, uh, there was a case of a, a mass blockade of a satirical uh, anti-Kremlin Twitter accounts. And was only after a strong reaction from users that those accounts became unblocked. But all this happened at the same time, and it was clearly a synchronized, organized campaign. Another method that gets used is, and is quite popular, ever since the Soviet times, that is pretending to be uh, the masquerading as a given person or organization. We block an account and we spread information from an alternative site which is very similar with a very small difference and on that fake side we uh, introduce more disinformation so these are just a few examples, and I could go on and on. But the problem is that these things are very difficult to investigate. Uh, and uh, I think we, we are having a crisis of scale the, um, uh, that we can really not con uh, imagine such a scale as Olgino in Poland. So do you know that there are no such things in Poland? Because we have heard many times that under some articles we can see that these are contents that are written by trolls, that the ways, uh, do you think that there is an uh, army of uh, Polish trolls like that? I cannot uh, say there is or there isn't. But when you read internet forums, that information does indeed get copied over and over. The, the text is repeated in many different places. And under a certain article uh, on a sensitive subject, even within three minutes, there is a uh, more than uh, a whole page text uh, that uh, can oppose it. So it's impossible that someone could write it in such short time. Uh, so we have no knowledge of uh, an Olgino in Poland, but there are probably persons who are paid for publishing such content. No, we didn't hear the comment from the floor, but maybe you know it, sir. I have no knowledge about that, although we didn't hear what the comment was. Right. Have, has any of you, ladies, ever become a victim to trolling? Has, ever, has that ever happened to you? I have been talking too much, so I'll be the last to take the floor. Ever been trolled? 
Uh, yeah, myself, I recently became the uh, victim of uh, the troll attack, and there are two types of those attacks against me and the institution I'm working with. Uh, first of all, for the Russian uh, domestic audience, the troll are trying to portray us as uh, uh, thief Jewish column, national traitors, and uh, other stuff like that. But the for the foreign audience, they are trying to find the links between uh, me, my colleagues, institution, and the Kremlin. And that's now a very popular tactic uh, aimed at discrediting uh, Russian liberals in the eyes of uh, the Western public. Uh, yes, uh, and many times. Uh Basically, any activity I, I did or made back in Czech Republic and Slovakia was met with some reaction. Uh, when I published a study, uh, it's a, re a publication, uh, it was, I think, June 2015, uh, our website, PSSI website, was basically collapsing for two weeks uh, out of nothing, suddenly. We don't know the reason yet, but... It's kind of a suspicious, the time, uh, timing of this. Then uh, I've been receiving a lot of emails, uh, threats. Well, they're not really threats like they're going to harm me or anything. Like, for example, Jessica Arrow. That's really an, one of the most extreme uh, cases. But I've been just like accused that I'm like either paid by CIA or NATO or I am paid by whoever or Another tactic is uh, that I'm like kind of like discrediting me, that I'm too young, or I'm a woman, or I'm a Slovak in Czech Republic. How can, I shouldn't? I'm not eligible to say anything. Um, so these are these are the activities they've been doing. I don't know. I once had an interview with one of the major uh, media uh, in in Czech Republic. It was also almost a year ago, and within like few hours, two three hours, there were four thousand comments under underneath, which I don't understand. How can somebody have a uh, so much time and uh, to 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 be commenting thousands of uh, comments? But um, I tend. I usually don't read it, so I don't know what was written there, but there were many of them. Yes, yes, I've also been a victim to that, but I'm not going to dwell on that. Well, yes, the same for us. The Polish Russian Center was also a victim to that on many occasions, right? Oh, yes. Well, I haven't not been working for the Polish Russian Center for a while now, but these are your classical hackers' attacks. I think it's called uh, DOS, denial of service, right? So they enter your website so many times that it's kind of overloaded and other people can't open the website. I, I don't remember what publication it was that caused this attack. Maybe Olga or Lukas will remember. I think it was also in line with the Intersection Pro, which is related to us. You know, what, what they were writing uh, in, in their articles, which are not patriotic for Russia. But yeah, it was, a, it was your classical DOS attack with a huge number of uh, computers entering the website and basically breaking it down. Because in addition to the trolls, the people who try to influence the debate, you also have all these um, cybernetic threats or IT threats where you attack the infrastructure. And uh, that's also something we've got to deal with. You know, websites of different institutions are attacked, or media websites, if, if a given newspaper publishes something bad about Russia. Now, over to you, Olga. What direction is the Russian propaganda going towards now? When the Maidan started in Ukraine, the reaction in the Russian media that I monitor 
almost immediately was, and I even saved screenshots, Komsomolska Pravda and others said that the Banderovci and the, the Ukrainian junta is going to attack Moscow, but they will start with Crimea, so we have to rescue the Russians who are living in Crimea. And later the annexation happened, but, and then I realized that for some time before the annexation, the Russian people were being prepared for that attack. So as you look at what the Russian media are writing now, what is the direction they are heading? Um, now we can see at least two uh, trends in developing of Kremlin propaganda. Uh, first of all, uh, if if before uh, domestic propaganda had incorporated methods of uh, manipulation of both Orwell and Huxley styles, and now due to the economic crisis and lack of perspective of uh, uh, domestic development, oral type of manipulation is the only available, available uh, method for the Kremlin. By Huxley style manipulation, I of course mean obedience through uh, pleasure, using positive messaging, hosting like uh, hosting the most expensive uh, Olympic Games ever, or evident uh, growth of real incomes of the past decade and others. Now it's getting harder and harder to use and to find this positive uh, messaging. Uh, thus, we are left with Orwell-style manipulation, obedience through pain, hate, uh, and an image of uh, an enemy, uh, both external and internal enemies. Thus, we would be right to say that the numbers of uh, enemies that Russia has will be expanding, maybe even including some Russian minorities. For example, this was exactly the case with uh, homophobia, which was largely extant uh, from uh, Russian public or opinion and discussion until it was forcefully brought in from the top and made one of the tenant of uh, Putin's national idea. And we must realize that uh, this can happen to any minority in Russia today. This trend might lead to an even greater radicalization of Russian society in the nearest future. Negativistic agenda and artificial image of uh, the besieged hatred, uh, fortress, uh, surrounded by the uh, enemies which Russians have to live in now, doesn't pass by without having a certain uh, effect on psychological and mental health of Russian society. Not only different phobias and intolerance are blossoming here, uh, but also propaganda leads to the rise of uh, aggression in the society, the rise of crimes. Uh, their created hate uh, need to be somehow channelized. Thus, we could expect a uh, growth of number of crimes committed in Russia and burst of uh, aggressions uh, similar that we had uh, seen a few days ago in Marseille. Uh, all that makes the perspective of uh, peaceful coexistence of you know, the West and Russia in the nearest future even more cloudy. Uh, that's, why, that's why today it's important not only to fight Russian propaganda in Europe, but also start uh, examining Russian, how to heal Russian society with the help of European media, how to help Russian society to get, get rid of these negativistic propaganda effects. And second trend of uh, Kremlin propaganda is directly linked to the, economic, to the ongoing economic crisis. Kremlin would have to shrink the budgets on propaganda in the foreseeable future. But this would not affect the budgets uh, spent on for domestic propaganda. Uh, that would limit, uh, it, it's highly likely that it would limit the budgets spent for the Western audience. And we could already see that on the examples of uh, Sputnik uh, that actually closed down its work for Finland, Sweden, Norway, and Denmark in their local languages. So in the foreseeable future, most of the attempts of Russian propaganda for foreign audience would be spent for English, through the English-speaking channels and some of the media broadcasted Kremlin myths in the local European languages uh, would be closed. Thank you. Dziękuję. Dziewczyny, jeszcze chcę zadać jedno pytanie. 
Right. Thanks so much. And um, another question to Ivana and to Justina, and then we will open the floor to questions from the audience. The question is, how effective is that Russian propaganda and the trolling? As I look at opinion polls in Russia, it seems that it's very effective inside of Russia, but what about outside of Russia? Right then. Just one word of comment about uh, the situation inside of Russia. Olga mentioned that uh, legitimization of the activities of Kremlin would result from the need um, to show legitimacy of this government in the eyes of the Russian society. And uh, there's a discussion going on, where should this mandate come from? Over the past two years, first we saw the annexation of Crimea, which the propaganda says was uh, bloodless, there was no bloodshed. That's what the Russian government and, uh, and the media are saying. And that was a huge injection that invigorated the Russian system and helped Putin survive another year. And it was only in the autumn of uh, last year, so that's like a year and a half, actually, after the Crimea. And then in autumn of last year, a need for something new came up, so we had Syria. But it turned out that Syria, even though the activities were very concrete, military activities that the Russians did not deny, they didn't have to say, we are not there, but we are winning. On the contrary, it was quite open, but that did not bring about very good results like the annexation of Crimea had. And for some time, we had this assumption that uh, Cre the Kremlin will try to get legitimacy by running wars outside of the country. So we had Crimea, then Syria, so we thought maybe another con conflict was coming up, a small-scale one, of course, to, to use a conflict like that to uh, basically to, to have a new wave of uh, consolidation of society on the side of the Kremlin. So there's a big problem for the Kremlin because waging a war is costly. Even if it's a small war, even if it's a small-scale conflict, the money is needed. So the question is, you know, you're spending money, what is uh, the benefit you are getting for the money you've spent? So how effective this conflict is in getting your objectives? In other words, does the support for the government go up as a result of the war? Now, if we ask what the Kremlin is going to use in the future, I think a virtual war is the answer. Because a virtual war does not cost that much money, and you can wage it without very significant costs, but you can prove to your society that your army is invincible, that nobody can tell us what to do, that we are autonomous on the international stage, that we do whatever we like. And that kind of relates to what Olga said before. Now, is this propaganda effective out, uh, outside of Russia? Well, I believe it is. And it is effective because of the quality of the media and the public debate in our countries, that the quality of the public debate is very low in our countries and that makes it easier for the Russians. And this is a difficult situation, I believe. The only situation in a perfect world to, to respond to disinformation is to teach people to think independently, to analyze information, to be able to pick the grains of truth from a stream of lies. But it's very difficult 
poziomie. A to carry tym, out on a mass scale. To, co robi, to, co robi Krem, to and the problem is that what the Kremlin is doing, as you said before, it is not so much for us to believe the official versions presented by Russia. No, it's about uh, distorting the facts. Right? So any conversation should end by us saying, well, you know, the truth is somewhere in the between, in the middle, you know, nobody knows what the situation really is like, we can never learn anyway. So that's the objective, this nihilism and relativism, you know, it's like a post-modernist attitude in the media that there is no truth which uh, is a slogan that everybody knows. So I believe that in this respect, the Kremlin's propaganda is very effective because it contributes to a process which is already there, that the quality of public debate has uh, been becoming lower and lower and that we have a lot of different problems in the media, like uh, the lack of proper financing for in many types of media. So, what we can see is that there is a number of different processes happening at the same time, uh, like anti-liberal rise, the lack of belief in the institutions, euroscepticism, uh, unwillingness to accept uh, strangers, migrants, people with different color of skin, homosexuals, and so on. So all of these processes overlap and amplify, and you get uh, white noise. And if you, there is a lot of noise, you are not able to see what the real, true information is. And the problem with propaganda is that it gives you easy answers. In all this uh, chaos of things, suddenly there's a conspiracy theory which explains everything to you in three sentences. And that's why I do believe that the Kremlin's propaganda is effective. Over to you. Uh, okay, it's always hard to, to go third with the same question because basically everything uh, has been said. Uh, whether propaganda or Russian disease. Actually, I, first of all, I don't like to call it propaganda because Russia doesn't really have much to propagate. As we said, like uh, it shouldn't be called Russian propaganda, but more like Kremlin disinformation yeah. because it's not propaganda. There's nothing to propagate. Uh, whether it's effective, uh, if you ask me a year ago, I'm going to talk about Czech Republic and Slovakia, but. I think it's applicable to other countries as well. If you asked me a year ago, I would be kind of torn over the issue. I, w I wouldn't be sure like whether it's effective because it was more about Ukraine and like Banderita, fascists there, and it's too far from Czech Republic, Slovakia, even though it's not true. It's Slovakia has got the border with Ukraine, but for people it's usually too far. Uh, but now. Uh, this has changed. Like I think the what really was a game changer was the immigration crisis or, or the the um, the problem with immigration that we have. Uh, this has really changed the debate significantly. Uh, suddenly, you have something that you can really use against your own government, against your own uh, media people. Suddenly, you can. Before it was something that was far away, now there is something which is directly, people feel feel like it's directly threatening them. And you can play with the fear very effective. That's a very effective weapon. Um, and I, second thing, I also absolutely agree that it's connected to, to so many processes or like the trends in the society that are already here. I feel like discussions about Kremlin disinformation has been too much focused on, on Russia. I think it's. Uh, I think Russia only uses what's here, uh, what problems we have. It's this frustration of, of, of in the society that's here. That's the most problematic for me. Uh, it's it's why people don't trust EU. Why they don't trust their own governments. There's a huge crisis of elites that's in Czech Republic, Slovakia, but it's also in the other states as well. You can uh, and this is like. This is this is like being like I think whether it's effective, it's very hard to say if if only the Russian 
Kremlin disinformation is effective. But these old trends uh, are showing results, and the Russian propaganda is only using it and overplaying, the, overplaying and exaggerating them. Uh, you can see what happened recently in in uh, Austria, the the recent. Uh, presidential election, they almost uh, extreme right uh, candidate almost won. It was really uh, uh, just few persons or, or very few people uh, was a difference. In Slovakia, we had par parliamentary elections and in March, and there we have now we have neo-Nazi extreme right in the government, uh, in the gov no, in the parliament, which this hasn't hasn't happened for 50 years, uh, and suddenly you have them in the in the parliament. You can see the discussion about about Brexit right now in in Great Britain. There's an, uh, another manifestation of this frustration that people have with their elites. Uh, you can see what the Donald Trump is saying. Uh, another, I think these all phenomena are connected and. I think we need to more talk about like what's wrong with our society, why people don't trust traditional parties, they own, they own media, they own politicians, and how do you rebuild this trust? Because I think that's the key besides education, besides uh, debunking, uh, it's more about rebuilding the trust in, in, in EU why people don't understand, many people don't even understand what the EU is all about. It's so complicated that just people have no clue what, what's happening in the Brussels. And then, of course, they cannot in identify with it. And they, they feel like the politicians are so disconnected from, from the problems of, of normal people. They have no answers for, for, the, for the basic questions that they have, like why my daughter, daughter cannot get a job, why I can't pay my loan. And then there's somebody coming with easier answers. These are populi populists, this is Russian Kremlin disinformation, and this is all these kind of extreme uh, parties and politicians. Thank you. So finally, time that time has come for questions from the audience. Uh, you have talked about companies in Poland. Could you share your knowledge with us about uh, those firms or, f or is it farms in Poland? Uh, Thank you very much. There has been an article recently showing uh, the activity of uh, such firms during the election. It was demonstrated that there are, that there are companies which employ students mostly. They pay 0 0.8 slot per tweet. The texts are prepared beforehand from a good source, texts which can discredit other information. And the attacks are quite immediate. If you look at the Polish Twitter, there are very many eggs and nicks which change all the time, uh, depending on the way they are. Arab nicks, Russian nicks, which disappear right away because the Polish Twitter users know how to defend themselves. They just block those people. I have been attacked in many cases like that. And we have talked among experts on the Smolensk disaster, and my statements could be found on the web. And of course, all our group was attacked for thinking reasonably, because having appropriate knowledge, we presented a position which was, and still is, unpopular in Poland. You can track the profile of Mr. Lasek, how often he is attacked by trolls when he talks about the Smolensk disaster. They are organized groups, and if we look back at uh, the last election, 
That was very well organized. And I do not want to make a political comment because that's not my job, but I know things like that do exist. If we, yes, please stay away from the current politics. And, and please do not turn off my microphone because then I will think that uh, the Russian propaganda has uh, found its way. But, but these things aren't new. For people dealing with security, of which I am one, this is just a new environment for uh, spreading lies and propaganda. Um, you must have heard about uh, the horns of Jericho, which uh, broke down the walls of Jericho. So it wasn't the, ac the actual sound of the trumpets, but the, uh, the attackers uh, sounded the horns daily, pretending that they are attacking the walls of Jericho, and the defenders came out of the walls and then went back. And for several days of attacks, finally the defenders uh, became Tea, uh, tired of going out and back in, and one day they didn't get out to the walls, and thus, the, thus Jericho was uh, conquered. Can we have the microphone over to the side? Yes, the microphone is needed because there are recordings and the, the interpreting. Good evening, Jan Michałowicz. The world today is a bit different than it used to be. We have the social media and different ways of acting. So the question is, why did this discussion focus on uh, the Russian trolling. Please note that a few years ago we, there was an election in the US. There were 300,000 emails uh, per day and 6,000 websites uh, to promote one of uh, the candidates. It was completely legal and that's the way things are done these days. So I do not know why you focus on uh, the Russian propaganda, which does exist and does use dirty methods. Uh, but Everybody does it. Uh, if we want to do it uh, openly, then we do so. If not, then we hire someone. That's the way things are done these days. The answer is very simple. It is because the organizer is the center of Polish-Russian dialogue and understanding. If this was the Polish-American center, then we would be talking about uh, American propaganda. Thank you for the comment. Andrzej Kopczyński, I would like to ask, because we have heard here the Russian Ministry of Defense gives money. To whom? To propaganda? To the strolling. Money for the strolling. But what I'm interested in is where the brain of the operation is. It used to be so that there was a unit in the Kremlin, there was a secretary of the party who controlled it. Is there a group of concrete people around Putin uh, who deal with this? And what, is, and what is the relationship between trolling and terrorist threat in Europe? As for the horns of Jericho, um, there was, was a story that they, that they uh, made infrasounds that can break up even the worst of all. So I don't know which one is true. <laughs> Minister of Foreign uh, of, of Defense, uh, I didn't mean that it paid for Kremlin trolls directly, but the guy who pays uh, and who is sponsoring uh, the troll factory, he's also uh, creating bankers for Kremlin, and uh, he also has contracts with the Russian uh, Ministry of uh, Defense. So we. I cannot say that the money goes through the Minister of Defense directly. That would be wrong. Uh, I'm going to comment 
to, to, to the previous question or comment, uh, you can look at this from so many perspectives, for so many, uh, yes, social media absolutely changed the way people get their information. My generation, young people, they don't even, they don't buy newspapers. They, they go on Facebook, they go on Twitter, and that's how they got their information. And this is a huge vulnerability of, of, of the society. And if it's not Russia, then somebody else can be using it. China has, is really active on this. Uh, Islamic State is misusing uh, social media for, for the recruiting services. Uh, if it's not Russia, that, then somebody else. And yes, the proper response is to build society that is that is uh, media literate and able to distinguish between what's false and what's not. Um, unfortunately, this is not happening. Uh, uh, this this change or like information revolution basically has not been reflected by our educational system. Uh, there's nothing like media literacy or just like subjects on on social media in high schools in in primary school nowhere. And uh, I think this is a huge challenge for the policymakers and for the EU governments, not just EU, uh, basically anywhere to 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 change this. But uh, this is for, this will bring result, even if we start now, this will bring results in 10, 15, 20 years maybe. Uh, but what the Russian is do, Russia is, uh, Kremlin is doing, this information assault, the information war that's happening right now. So that's why I think the discussion is now focused, besides it's organized by the, by the center. And also, uh, I really don't like comparing Russian or Kremlin disinformation with what the United States is, for example. There's nothing like American, pro yes, it's normal. There's nothing like American propaganda which you can compare what, to what's happening to Russia. I think it's totally justifiable and normal for every state to have its uh, agenda abroad. Uh, Czech Republic has got a cultural center all over the Ukraine. Uh, America, uh, United States got uh, Radio for Europe. Uh, UK has got BBC. But you cannot really say then Russia has got uh, RT or Sputnik. I think this is totally a different uh, level. They're misusing information and they're using conspiracy theories, uh, lies and fakes uh, to manu manipulate people uh, for its own benefit. Uh, it's not really propaganda. This is more information war. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more questions? The gentleman in red. Mateusz Bajek. I have uh, investigated propaganda uh, in Sputnik, previously the voice of Russia, and I've been doing so for three years. In the past, I've uh, been playing uh, computer games there, and now I watch what the trolls do there. Uh, so uh, I would like to comment on uh, how the how the propaganda looks, what what the trolls are like, and I observed some incredible things that the troll factories uh, do in the Polish market. The fact that uh, since uh, November 24, 2013, that is three days after Maidan began, if I get the years correct. Uh, suddenly, hundreds of profile, uh, profiles uh, were established ever since 23rd of November. There were all new profiles with friends in India and elsewhere in the world, but not in Poland. And back then, it's like in the beginning of uh, antibiotic use. You could fight it relatively easily. You just showed them that uh, you were established seven days ago. Come on. And they disappeared. At, after some time, they started developing. Uh, they started creating some more elaborate profiles. But to catch a troll like that, it is not difficult. And uh, it is my passion to try to do that. Uh, it's so sometimes a troll uh, who has uh, a Polish name uh, speaks in Japanese because he gets his accounts right uh, wrong. 
um, uh, he just uh, forgot to log uh, log off and on. Uh, so sometimes a Polish account uh, responds uh, on instead of a Japanese one, which was established for the same purpose. And those people disconnect, and new ones uh, spawn. But it's all people. They repeat the same schemes. They call me this Bandera uh, officer. Uh, currently, I observe elections in the East, and I go there a lot. And they attack me as someone who probably uh, helped in Austria, uh, helped that Green Party representative win the election. So it, it's all a part of the same subject. Sputnik is uh, an interesting medium for such observations because uh, it is one of the few uh, that doesn't block people with critical views. Uh, so you can uh, really put off some steam there. But it is a, it is worthwhile to, to, to see what people write there. It's not worthwhile to read the articles, but it's great fun to read the, the commenters there. You just have to build some resistance and uh, you must realize that they are not real people they they are f uh, fake accounts established to and created to to write such stuff one more thing that has been mentioned uh, the russian propaganda in the, on the polish internet i think all of you know that our extreme right was uh, overtaken quite late because before uh, Maidan, you could hardly see any pro-Russian tendencies. But over a period of a month, this, these things have changed. For, for example, Kresse PL um, uh, suddenly uh, made a turnaround and started writing how great Putin is. <clears throat> we have also some attempts uh, to affect uh, the public uh, on uh, the uh, left. Uh, Tribuna EU, which is the uh, left voice in our homes. Uh, it is a portal established by former journalists of uh, the Voice of Russia and then Sputnik, which tries to affect the left side of the, the society, uh, including the young people. And they do so by um, employing two leaders of that party, one of those girls after some suggestions where they got money for the portal. She uh, left the portal. I don't know about the other one. But the fact that the company <coughs> has money for running such portal, and uh, it is run by the same people who are always connected to the Voice of Russia, it's quite obvious that they are connected with money from the East. But the fact that they don't write pro-Russian things, it is a part of um, the path that uh, you talked about, the anti-establishment fight. It's not that everything they write is wrong. And I think that's the point, that, that it shouldn't be all the way one thing. It, it, it's supposed to um, arouse our trust. Uh, so that uh, you could then take over and go all the way. Yes, uh, sometimes uh, they forget to, to uh, log off and on. And another mistake is that sometimes they forget to turn off geolocation. I have seen uh, people writing that here there are bombs of uh, the Ukrainian fascists coming here in, uh, in Donbass, and we see that they write from St. Petersburg in Russia. Are there any more questions? So I guess this brings us to the conclusion. So thanks to our great heroines of tonight.